All right, we're on. Let me get the chat. Hello and welcome. Hello, welcome. I see people coming in. Uh, you'll notice that you are on mute. If you do have any questions, you can feel free to um, go into the chat part portion at the bottom of your screen and you can um, chat us. And we'll give everyone another like minute or so to come in before we begin. Okay, let's begin. So hello and welcome. My name is Janae Dominguez. I am a BCBA here at Beerman and I have Felicia Bennett, who is a speech language pathologist also at Beerman joining me today. We'll be covering the basics of speech therapy and the basics of ABA and an overview of teaching strategies. So the format today is going to be speech therapy for the first half of our uh, training and then the basics of ABA after. So let's begin. Um, just so you guys know, during the webinar, everyone will be muted. This is an active participation webinar in which I'll be pausing frequently to ask questions. You can respond with the chat feature. For the chat feature, you can send your answers directly to me or to all panelists. Uh, Felicia and I will refrain from using anyone's names um, and we won't use child's na children's names throughout the presentation. The chat is the easiest and most efficient way to communicate throughout the webinar. If you chat the panel, panels and attendees, everyone can see your responses versus if you only pick panelists in which I'll read the answer without mentioning any names and unless you specify that you want me to read them. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to chat them and then I will um, facilitate that throughout the presentation. All right, let's begin. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Felicia Bennett, and I am one of Beerman's speech language pathologists. And I'm just glad that you guys are joining in with us this evening to know more about ABA and speech therapy. Um, first, I just want to take a poll to know how many of you has had experience with speech language services for your child. One being no. Uh, two being one to six months of services, six to 12 months of services or 12 or more. Okay, I am seeing it. <laughs> yeah, the poll moves quickly. All so right. We'll give everyone like up to like 30, 45 seconds to. Okay, cool. And then we'll share it with everyone so they can see. Okay, I see 82% of you have voted. So I'll end the poll and then we'll share. All right. So it looks like most of you had like 12 or more months of services and then 29% none. All right, but okay. So today we're just gonna kind of, um, you know, explain what speech therapy is, the areas that we assess and provide treatment and also how we do it here at Beerman. Okay. So what is speech therapy? So when we say communication, communication encompasses language and speech skills. So we are not just looking at how someone says their words or how fluent or free flowing they are um, with their words, but also how they use their words, phrases or sentences, and how they are comprehending what is being said to them from another person. 
We also look at how they make adjustments in their conversations in different environments and with different people. Um, speech therapy also involves feeding and swallowing as well as cognitive executive functions like working memory, planning, organizing, and flexible thinking. So speech disorders. So as a speech therapist, you know, I'm looking at how someone uses their articulators. So I'm talking like lip, jaw, teeth, tongue to make sounds um, with their vocal cords. So we look at like the misarticulations, the substitutions that might happen, um, syllable structure breakdowns and distortions like having a lisp. Um, so that's where we're talking about the articulation and phonological disorders. And then we have motor speech disorders like childhood apraxia, where the brain is not communicating too well with the muscles of the articulators. And once again, that jaw, lip and tongue to make sounds or to produce sounds. And then we have dysarthria, where there is a weakness in the muscles to move those articulators properly. Um, and then we have orofacial myofunctional disorders, which are like abnormal movement patterns of the face and mouth. So we're looking at the structures of the child's face to see if it's symmetrical or asymmetrical, if there's an overbite, an underbite, if there's just not a lot of tongue movement. Um, sometimes older children that might have cleft palate, which produces challenges when it comes to speech and feeding. And then uh, we also have disfluency, um, like with stuttering. So we look for like repetitions of syllables or words. Uh, we also look for hesitations, blocks or prol prolongations. Um, stuttering may be accompanied with body movements or facial expressions. Um, some stuttering is normal during language development because the child is picking up so many words and learning how to like formulate um, formulate their sentences and phrases, but it doesn't, um, but it doesn't, but if it doesn't disappear by the age of five, then that's where we we'll probably look further and try to come up with some strategies to decrease those disfluencies. Also, lastly, we have voice disorders. So this is where we look at how the voice sounds. So I'm looking at if the individual is speaking very soft or they're speaking too loud, um, do, is their voice very hoarse um, or do they sound nasally like they have a head cold or is it breathy and then like why it is happening. And then we have language where we look for how someone uses language and how they understand it. So we have expressive language, which is how someone uses their words. So as you can see, you know, we're looking at vocabulary, how many different types of words the child is using from like verbs to nouns to concepts like spatial and quantitative. Uh, we are also looking at grammar. Does a child use the correct tense of a verb such as eat, ate, um, possessives like yours and mine. Um, also, we look at the sentence structure. Um, it could be as simple as using like one to two, three words, or it could be as complex like having contractions like would, would not or wouldn't, or conjunctions like but and and. Um, and then we have receptive language, which is how someone understand the language that's being used. So following like one to multiple step directions, as simple as stand up and pushing your chair or as complex as go to the kitchen, open the refrigerator, give me three red apples. So like right there in that direction, there's like so many parts to it. So first the child had to be able to find the location between, all right, do I go to the bathroom? Do I go to my bedroom or do I go to the kitchen? All right, kitchen. Now they have to go into the kitchen and then be able to identify, all right, Am I looking for the microwave? Am I looking for the dishwasher? Am I looking for the sink? Oh no, I'm looking for the fridge. And then we had the concept of, oh, am I gonna open the fridge? Do I close it? Do I stand next to it? What do I do? And then we have the concepts of like, 
the quantitative concept of three, because now we don't want one, we want three apples, and then the noun, the apples, and then the color of the apples. And then also then that they have to bring that items to you, not to someone else. So um, that's something that we look at and see how we can like break it down to make it simple for a child. If we, if we have to write it, or if we have to give some auditory cues, something that helps them to be able to follow directions. And then being able to discriminate between a what question and a where question, um, finding objects in an array of two or more or versus finding the objects in the natural environment. So, and also keep in mind that receptive language typically develops first before expressive language. So that's why a lot of times we encourage parents to really do a lot of talking and pointing and looking with their child um, because that's what develops first. Um, so, yeah. Um, and then we have social skills, or this is like pragmatics. So with social skills, we look at how uh, we communicate and how we interact with others. Um, there are different reasons why we do it. Um, we may say hi, we may ask for something, we may tell them about like our weekend and go to like, hey, I saw this person did that. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why we interact with others and what we're telling people. Um, then we change how we communicate based on the person, place, and or situation. So how I talk to you all in this webinar is different with how I talk to my family or how I talk to my friends. Um, if I am, you know, see a baby sleeping, I most likely will be quiet or talk in a whisper versus if I'm out in a crowd, I'm going to talk louder. And then we have those conversational rules. So we work on like, you know, not being able to overtake a conversation or being one sided or knowing when to um, enter a conversation, when to exit. Um, being able to read nonverbal behaviors like body language and facial expressions. And these are just a few things that we look at um, with social skills. And sometimes we'll like address these with social stories. Or we might address them with video modeling or having those peer interactions and just being able to facilitate and so that the child is able to learn what we're teaching um, in that moment. Okay, then we have augmentative and alternative communication. So with AAC, it's gonna be augmentative by adding to someone's natural voice or it's gonna, and or it could be alternative to use in place of someone's natural voice. AAC accomplishes like many things like communicating wants and needs, being able to share information, creating those interactions with others, having social etiquette and be able to communicate with oneself. So with AAC, like visual supports like a first then board um, or a token board as an example, um, how many of you guys create a grocery list before going to the store? This is also a form of AAC because you're communicating to yourself what to buy and to make sure that you don't go over your budget. Um, so like using a calendar, texting, these are like other forms of AAC. All right, so we have like another poll going on. We only doing true and false. AAC delays speech and language development. What are your guys' thoughts on that? Ooh, okay. It's fast. I know. Give him like 15 more seconds. Okay. All right. So most of you guys were just like 94% said false. And that is right. Yes. I love it. Um, Sorry. <laughs> no, sorry. I got too excited. I think this is the next one, right? Yes. So we have myths. So here are some myths about AAC that may keep people from using it. So one, the child won't use their voice. Um, there is research that supports that this will not delay speech or language development. 
actually some kids do develop the use of natural speech through the use of pecs, signs, or through a speech generated device. Um, sometimes are like iPads that have like the apps like touch chat and lamp. Those are just some examples. Um, two, like they're too young. No, AAC, um, it has been seen as a last resort if a child was not communicating by a certain age, but babies as young as eight to 12 months will use signs if they're taught them early. Uh, and prerequisites. Um, there's no cognitive level that your child need in order to use AAC. If your child could look, grab, reach, point, move their head, engage, we can find some form of AAC to work best for them. Um, it's so frustrating to have no way to communicate with someone. So AAC gives that person some way to communicate than to have no way to communicate at all. Feeding and swallowing. Whew. So I hope you guys are like taking it all in. <laughs> So there are like three or four phases we look at during swallowing. During the oral phase, we look at how the lips, teeth, tongue, and jaw are working together to prepare and form the bolus. The bolus is like food, saliva, liquid, all mixed together. And then how the food is moved from the front of the mouth to the back of the throat. And then we have the pharyngeal phase where swallowing is initiated and the food is compressed the vocal folds are closed to protect the airway, the larynx raises, the epiglottis moves um, to protect the airway as well. And then the bolus moves to the esophagus. And then we have the esophageal phase where the muscles contract and pushes the bolus down into the stomach. So there is a lot going on during the swallowing process. Like many people think that the vocal folds only function is for us to be able to talk, but actually it's to be able to protect our airways and to regulate that airflow in and out of our lungs. Um, so going back to those stages, um, so I'm looking for like during the oral phase, like is the food falling out the mouth? Are they drooling? Um, when they use a spoon or a fork, is the food, is the, all of the food removed or is there still some particles left? Um, um, during the pharyngeal phase, I'm looking for like, are they clearing their throat? Is there some nasal drainage going on? Um, are they coughing? Um, are, is there a change in their voice after, after they eat or after they swallow? And then in the esophageal phase, um, are they spitting up? Are they throwing up? Are they having some stomach issues? Um, so as a speech therapist, I am looking for those signs that would indicate or raise concern for a feeding or swallowing disorder. Um, so if this is something that I can work on by strengthening the oral motor structures or incorporating like some type of concept compensatory strategy such as like alternating between liquids and foods, um, decreasing the consumption rate, then okay. But if it's something that I need to see like what else is going on, I may refer the child to see a specialist or to get a swallow study. So, um, this, uh, with the screen and evaluation here at Behrman, um, we will have the parents or guardians fill out a feeding intake and provide some information or some history of their child on feeding. Um, so some questions that will be asked is like, what's the child's diet? Uh, do they eat better with certain people or in certain situations? We'll ask if there's been a history of pneumonia. Um, we will ask like for you to recall like what the child ate in the last 24 hours. And then once that intake is received, um, we will observe. So some of the things that we'll observe are like the behaviors, like, you know, are they, you know, crying? Are, you know, are they having some tantrums? Um, I'm gonna be looking at their diet. Um, do I notice that they eat, they prefer to eat more soft foods like pudding or do they like to eat like bananas or, um, do they like crunchy foods? Um, I'm going to be looking at their oral motor structures, that swallowing, just like that process I was telling you guys about. Um, utensils, that's usually more OT. 
Um, but I'll be looking at the food clears off with their utensils. Um, posture, are they slumped over? Are they eating at a 90 degree? Um, does it prevent choking? And then, um, then I will collaborate with the team. So as you see with the team, with me, I'm looking at swallowing aura motor, OT, self-feeding, positioning, textures as well, and then BCBAs, the behaviors. So here at Beerman, we have like two models. Um, we have the consultative model where it is a non-billable service. So this is not gonna be billed to your insurance or anything. Um, so we're gonna collaborate with the ABA team and with you all uh, and parents. And then we're gonna assist with the treatment plan goals, um, provide an input on developmental milestones and speech and language skills, just to make sure that they're appropriate or that the child, they can make the right sounds at that age or if they should be what um, type of vocabulary they should be using um, and like, or following directions. If there's too many concepts, like that one direction that I gave you guys that had everything in it versus like, do we need to simplify it? Um, or do we need to um, some modifications so that they're able to reach that goal? Um, and then we have direct services, which is a billable service. This is something that will be, you know, billed to your insurance. Um, so basically, um, I will conduct an evaluation and uh, provide one-on-one -on -one direct speech and language services. So basically, once you have expressed interest in speech therapy. Um, I will give you guys like a form. It might be like a, it will either be a speech consult form if that's what we can do for right now. Or if we're like, okay, everything's good with your insurance. We can, then I can give you guys like the formal form. And then once you fill that out, um, I'll set up an appointment to uh, schedule the evaluation and then I'll evaluate the child. And then once I finish the evaluation, I'll set up a, a meeting with you. And then you, we will discuss the the results of the evaluation and the goals so who needs speech therapy <laughs> or who needs speech language pathology so like as you can see we work on many things mentioned in this webinar and more some things that i haven't talked about um, we work with many populations and ages um, I hope that you were able to gain more information about speech language pathology and I hope it um, and how it works here at Beerman. Any questions? Again, feel free to put it on the chat. And if you want just Felicia and myself to see it, you would just put it under panelists. And if you want everyone to see it, you would say all participants. Alicia, can you see the chat? Yeah, I'm looking at the chat. <laughs> no questions? Well, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to, that I may came up, come up later or anything, feel free to reach out to me through my email. Um, and I'll be definitely glad to answer any questions that you have. Um, or if you just kind of want to know like, get some more information about the process and how everything works again, that's totally fine. Just feel free to reach out to me. Um, I will be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. Oh, um, we got a question. It's oh, okay. how, how long are the speech therapy sessions at Beerman? Oh, okay, there we go. Um, so depending on the, um, the results of the evaluation, um, and the severity of the language or speech disorder is usually like one time a week for 60 minutes. If the child um, has like a severe articulation, phonological um, disorder going on, we might recommend um, two or more sessions a week for like 30 minute sessions. Um, it just, just depends on how um, the insurance is willing to work with us because sometimes they might have some stipulations or some things where we kind of have to like, do an appeal or we might have to like submit a reauthorization to request more um, sessions. There's another question, Felicia. Do you want me to read it to you? Yeah, because I'm not seeing the questions for some reason. It says, we're on a waiting list for my son to start coming to ABA in person. Are these services all for after he starts there? 
Um, yes, once um, he starts at Beerman, then um, you'll have your meeting with um, the CD <laughs> and uh, with his BA, and then they'll let us know if you guys are interested in services for speech or OT. And then we'll hop in, try to get into a meeting and talk about you know, what we can do. And then we'll at least start you off with the consultative services. Um, that's something that everybody can have. And then we'll work with you. And then once everything is like squared away with insurance, then we can get you on the list to be evaluated and have services. Another okay. question popped up. Okay, I can't see this one. Okay. You can see it or you can't? Yeah, I can't see it. Oh. Um, okay, for seven years old nonverbal child with AAC, how many sessions per week would be beneficial for him? Um, once again, that's going to depend on the child and like, and what is going on. I mean, also know too, that I will be collaborating with the BAs as well. So they're going to be not only getting their session with me, which is one-on-one, -on -one, but I'm going to be collaborating with the BAs and the BT so that they're incorporating those strategies into their sessions as well. Yeah, and I can attest to that as well as a BA. I know that I'm constantly asking my SLP questions and we're constantly evaluating our clients and making sure that whatever they're doing in speech is carrying over into our services as well. Okay. Um, and then uh, who will be doing the majority of speech language services daily? Um, well, the speech therapist will be doing the speech language services. Um, um, either like we said one time a week for an hour or two times a week for 30 minutes or however we can depending on um, you know what we can get with insurance and then we will be training the BAs and the BTs to be to be able to incorporate some of those strategies throughout their sessions so they can work on those every day and then we'll see progress um, more quickly okay, okay. Um, and then, more questions coming in <laughs> okay uh, sometime my four-year-old stutter, but it only when accompanied with tantrums, is that normal? Um, yes, I would say that is normal. I mean, when, you know, when we get upset, sometimes we're flustered. We're trying to like, trying to articulate how we feel, but it's like everything is going on. I mean, even for us adults too, sometimes that happens. We just figured out better ways to uh, cope with that when we when we're upset either it's just walking away and taking a minute but for some kids like because they haven't developed those coping skills and we haven't taught them that yet it's probably going to happen that they probably will stutter if accompanied by like a, a tantrum but that is normal okay do all speech therapists at Beerman do feeding evaluations um, yes if you are um, wanting uh, have definitely have concerns about feeding um, we will, like, like I said, give you that feeding, um, feeding intake, and then we will like do the evaluation. Now, like I said, if it's something that we feel like is maybe we need to have like a specialist or someone to further look into, like um, if the child we're like using like those those strategies to uh, decrease like food coming out the mouth or coughing and choking, then we're like, okay, we need a swallow study and we'll work with those specialists to figure out how to best um, treat the child. But yes, all the speech therapists at Behrman, we do um, the feeding evaluations. Okay. How does remote speech therapy work for a four-year-old? Can you go over what a typical session might look like? Um, so remote speech therapy, um, that it it probably depends on the child um i mean i definitely had situations where um i don't think that uh remote speech therapy will be beneficial for the child it just depends um there are some kids where like it's okay to do speech therapy and being able to work with the parent or another uh, person to facilitate and do more of like that natural environment training um, and just kind of giving that feedback. Um, but um, some kids, it does work to have remote and some um, it doesn't. I probably would recommend coming in clinic if that's the situation. Um, what if assurance only allows limited speech therapy sessions? Can you ask assurance to allow for more sessions. Yes, um, that has happened. And what we'll do is definitely 
if we're coming, um, cause yeah, sometimes even the uh, sessions are combined with OT. So sometimes like uh, we have those tough situations where we have to ask the parents like, hey, do you want more speech or OT? But if we get to the point where we're going to the end of um, their visits. Yeah, we will try to request more and do an appeal um, to get more sessions for speech or OT. Um, but it does happen and sometimes it, it might take a while, but, but yes. Um, my son is eight years old and has some stuttering issues. He has speech for two times a week. Do you think that can help him stop stuttering by the time he gets to 10? Um, that one, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, um, two times a week. I'm not sure how to answer that question, given that I don't know the whole uh, history of your son and like what is going on and what strategies they're using to um, decrease the fluent, um, this fluency. Um, but I'm not sure if that is something that we will see decrease by 10 years old. It, it definitely depends on what strategies are using and then um, and I will probably talk to your speech therapist on what uh, they feel um, is best and like what the prognosis will be. Um, sorry, I couldn't answer that question. <laughs> um, for young children that cannot come in person, can you recommend specific AAPs or online programs that would help with speech therapy for both receptive and expressive language. Yeah, um, definitely the, uh, with technology developing, there's so many apps. <laughs> and so I had just read the like APP and I was like, oh, apps. <laughs> um, there are so many apps and so many things out there with te uh, technology that, yeah, that I would recommend. Um, for teaching um, receptive and expressive language. But I'm gonna always tell parents that, you know, if you don't have the iPad or the apps, what would you use? Like use your natural environment. So like when you're in the kitchen with your child and you are, you know, wanting them to like um, label things, like, you know, talk about, you know, bring up a, you know, an apple, be like, oh, here's an apple, it's red, talk about it. Or like give the instructions like, oh, give me the apple, put it, in, you know, point to the apple, like talk about what you do with the apple. Like during play activities, that's like perfect. Play skills are like great for language development. Talk about like, all right, I'm gonna put the doll in the house. I'm gonna take it out. Oh, it's gonna cook. Doing those, like working on those pretend play skills. Like I'm always gonna recommend doing those things um, just because like the, uh, within the context, a child is able to gain so much just by you modeling and talking and talking about what you're doing. Um, then like with the apps, I mean, the apps work as too, but I always encourage natural environment teaching. There's also some questions in the chat. I don't know if you can see them, but I can read them to you. Um, so some of them are, what are the qualifications of a speech therapist at Beerman and where do you find them? Oh, okay. Um, so uh, for a speech therapist, we have to have a master's degree. Um, so we'll have like about two years of training. This includes um, clinical um, internships we, um, in the hospitals, nursing facilities, in a school. Um, and then even after we graduate, we have our clinical fellowship year, uh, which is about nine months, where we basically are supervised by another speech therapist who has their C's. Um, and they're going to be able to like give us feedback and, um, and just to, um, to help us like build our skills. And then after that nine month period post our master's degree, um, then we apply for our C's and then Asha's like, here, you are a speech therapist. Mm -hmm. Um, but speech therapy, we go through a lot of training. I mean, honestly, with what I did tonight, <laughs> like that is just like a brief <laughs> thing about each area. I mean, if I was to break down each area, it probably would take me like, I don't know, probably months to do like an hour on each thing just because it's just so much. But that's what I love about speech therapy. We, we kind of go into like all areas. But yes, the training, um, two years, master's degree, post nine uh -huh. months. Yeah. The next one, I don't know if you'll know the answer, but we'll ask. Any idea how long it takes for a speech therapist to be credentialed? The one at Behrman isn't credentialed under my health insurance. 
Okay, so the credentialing process, um, it, it can take a while um, <laughs> with insurances, uh, especially the type of insurance. Um, as I'm learning, um, sometimes it can take as easy as like two months or sometimes it can take even more or as such as like five months. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it's just one of those things that it takes a while to credential. Um, and at each um, insurance company, they have their different rules that, um, you know, that the billing department takes care of to make sure that we're, we're good. Um, but yeah, it does take a while, I'm sorry. Um, the next one is my son is two and a half, not speaking yet. He does make noises babbling. Uh, he was a preemie, how would I go for him? Okay, um, can you repeat that, I'm sorry. <laughs> so my son is two and a half and not speaking. He does make noises babbling. Okay. How would speaking um, go for him? Okay, um, so, with your child, like I would probably, um, once again, I'd probably like go see a speech therapist, but some things that you could probably do in the meantime is try to use, um, definitely like do some um, back and forth, like having him to, you know, try to babble back to you to get that back and forth conversation going on with babbling. Also, we could also incorporate like some AAC forms, like picture communication or signs, um, Definitely having that visual support um, for your son will probably be one to be able to give like a visual with the words that you're saying, but then also like giving him some way to communicate. So um, that's where I would start with, but definitely um, look into getting a speech therapist to kind of work on developing and figuring out what ways uh, will work for him to get him to communicate and uh, formulate more sounds. Um, next one is, if we worked with a different provider for OT services, do you coordinate with them for speech and language? Yes, um, definitely. There are some um, kids who do receive outside services. So I will try to definitely work with their providers if they're seeing another speech therapist or if they're seeing an OT or PT and try to like make sure that we're on the same page. Um, but yes, we definitely do um, collaborate with outside providers. Awesome. There's two more. Um, so it says, my child uses touch app. Which speech app is the best for my child? Okay. Um, th this question, um, I can say it depends. Like with AAC, we have like a formal like kind of evaluation where we look at which uh, mode of communication works best for the child. So we're going to be looking at, can we use sign or pegs, or are we going even looking at the speech apps such as touch chat or lamp. So we just kind of see which one works best. Um, I don't know, since I don't know your child, which one would work best, but um, definitely work with a speech therapist to see if you can't even get an AAC evaluation to figure out which one works best for your, um, for your child. Um, the last one, it says, could you name specific apps that you recommend? There's so many and little information, so it's really hard for parents to know what are truly helpful from a therapist perspective. If you can't think of one off the top of your head, we do send this, um, this presentation to you guys in the next couple of days. That'll be sent, and um, Felicia then could accrue a list and send that as well, if you can't think of them on the spot. Oh, okay. Um, I know, like, there is this app. Um, I'm, like, pulling up my my ipad right now <laughs> uh, some apps that i have um um super duper they usually have things with um like possessives or like irregular or regular verb tenses um they're also there's other ones like ways 10 which have like it's kind of like a jeopardy kind of thing going on uh where it has like a uh, social questions like what you would do in the community what would you do um um, with your like body language. Also, um, there is apraxia um, um, speech cues, which they kind of have like, um, like a visual models of like, of how to uh, use these hand cues like W for, to get to help facilitate that sound like wah. Um, also, even like a video model, sometimes I will even have kids watch that so that they can hear it and get that auditory bombardment so they can hear the sounds. Um, ooh, there's a lot of, a lot of apps out there, <laughs> but I could definitely get that list for you. Okay, and then the last question we have is, what process would you use for a three-year-old child with autism? Um, when you say process, what do you mean by process? Are you talking about like an evaluation process? 
Like, what does that look like? Okay, eval, yes. So, um, so once I get like the speech intake, um, I will kind of look at the information that you provide. And like, I, most times I have had, had some kind of contact with the child. Um, I'm in the Indianapolis location. <laughs> so um, I'll kind of determine what evaluations will be appropriate. I do try to do a standardized as assessments, like maybe the preschool language scale, or um, we have like um, the OWLS assessment, but then I'll also do like an informal assessment um, just to kind of, because sometimes with the standardized test, like you have to say it a certain way. And sometimes I think that's like not necessarily fair because, you know, children with autism, you know, have different ways of processing information. So I'll use like an informal assessment, like the functional communication profile, which is more like open-ended questions kind of asking me like, what can a child do? Can they name colors? Can they, um, do they localize sound to get more of an in-depth idea of like what the child is like? And so when I'm writing the evaluation for insurance so they can see that, okay, they have this standardized score, but here they also have these other set of skills that we couldn't assess because of how the standardized test is set up. Another question is, have you had a child come into Beerman as nonverbal and started talking at Beerman? Um, from my experience as a speech therapist, I have seen where a child come in with limited vocal skills. Um, and then as soon as we start using some strategies and using um, hand cues, then we'll start to see some vocalizations and then using words. Um, so that has happened. Um, but yes. Um, but I also want to also keep in mind too that sometimes too, um, you know, um, there are some some kiddos where maybe those vocalizations might not develop as quickly or it might take a longer time. Or if they don't, like I said, with AAC, we're looking at, I just want them to be able to communicate somehow. Because to have it's better to have some words than to have no words at all. Uh, the next question is, are there any standardized tests that can be administered remotely because of COVID, um, specifically for a four-year-old? Okay, um, so there are some tests. Um, I probably have to get back to you on like which ones because um, I haven't administered standardized tests um, remotely. Um, but I have heard from other speech therapists, there are some if the child is able to do it. Um, if not, if uh, we can't do a standardized test, that's where we'll do more of that informal, just kind of asking questions from the um, parents and probably observing and just kind of get some information to be able to kind of get an idea for the speech evaluation. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Felicia, for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you all for your questions. It's awesome. I mean, yes, really speech is a great uh, thing that we have at Beerman and I feel like we collaborate constantly. So it's nice to hear from an SLP. All the amazing things that you guys do. All right, thank you guys so much. And thank you for the questions. And I look forward to hearing from you all and what we do here at Beerman too. Awesome, thanks, Felicia. Oh, and then there's some resources as well. Like I said, I will send this presentation out to everyone. Um, so now we'll co cover the intro to ABA. Um, this will obviously be a little bit shorter because we're running out of time, but I will try and go through as quickly as possible and get you guys as much information as possible. So our mission here is to provide support to you, your child, and your whole family. This process is about making daily life easier for your child and everyone involved in your child's life. We're using behavior analytic research and science to guide our decisions on how, what to teach and how to teach it. While this is important, it can also be intimidating to understand, so we're here to help you break it down. And we want to collaborate and make your experience meaningful. We want this information to be helpful and useful to you. And we also want your input and feedback throughout this process. Please never hesitate to reach out to anyone on our team for support. So the objectives, like I said, I don't think we'll get through all of this, but that's fine. Uh, we'll define reinforcement and how it's used to change behavior, understand why behavior happens, not just what it looks like, identify different teaching strategies, and identify prompting strategies that can be used to teach new skills. So we'll launch into uh, your ABA experience. So I will be launching a poll as well. We love polls here. So one would be no previous ABA experience, haven't started services, three less, or I'm sorry, two, less than three months of ABA experience, so you're a new client, one year of ABA experience, and then four would be more than one 
year of ABA experience seasoned client. Awesome. Great. So it looks about like almost half of you, 46% of you have no ABA, previous ABA experience. 8% um, have less than three months, 23% have a year of ABA, and 23 have more than a year. So a nice mix. Okay. So I behave, you behave, we all behave all the time. Anything you do or your child does or your boss does or lady down the street is considered behavior. To get a clear picture of a person's behavior, it's important to label the behavior as objectively and precisely as you can. Try to avoid words using well, using words like good, bad, not listening, temper tantrum. While those words could relate to what is happening, they don't present a clear picture of what the behavior actually looks like. Why is this important? This is important because ABA services will look at a specific behaviors to increase and decrease the learner's daily life. And these can go hand in hand. So an example of this would be Sammy hits his mom every time he wants a cookie, he's taught to request a cookie and he gets it in replacement for hitting to get access to that. Now his requesting for a cookie increases and his hitting decreases. In this example, the behavior of requesting cookie increase. It's also important that the replacement behavior is something that the child can do easily. So keep your child's skill set in mind when choosing a replacement behavior. For example, if hitting is easy and effective in getting a cookie and a replacement of, hey mom, can you give me the cookie that's on the counter, is chosen for a replacement behavior, the child does not have a lot of vocal language. The child might likely resort to hitting as hitting is easier rather than give me a cookie or even just saying cookie as a replacement behavior, which is way easier to say. So what can ABA be used for? It can be used to increase specific behaviors. So we wanna increase communication, which includes requesting, following directions, labeling, conversations, answering questions. We wanna increase play behavior. So independent play, play with sibling, play with peers, social behavior, um, independence, so like washing hands, getting dressed, getting an item at the store, following directions at the dentist, food consumption, toileting. These are all behaviors that we want to increase. What are some behaviors, I'll put this in the chat, what are some behaviors that you would like to increase with your child? So think about, again, how we wanted it to be objective and clear. So do you want to increase them playing with their siblings, maybe communicating um, instead of engaging in like hitting um, social behavior? What are some behaviors that you would like to see? And you guys could just write it in the chat. Communicating, yeah, that's great. I think that's like a really big one that we always want to see. Communication, awesome. And communication come a lot of different ways, um, kind of what Felicia was saying. Um, toileting, communication, instead of aggression, socializing with peers, awesome. These are all amazing. Communication, yeah, communication's a big one and so important. Okay, great. We can also use ABA to decrease behavior. So the things we wanna decrease can be challenging behavior like hitting, crying, screaming, stereotypy. So that's um, engaging in some like motor movements that might be disruptive to a learner. Amount of time to complete a task or length of challenging behavior. So what are some behaviors that you would like to see decrease with your child? So it could be like challenging behavior like what we had hitting, crying, screaming, throwing things. Um, engaging in peer aggression, flapping hands, making loud noises. Okay. Flopping, aggression. Great. These are all great things that stimming. Okay. Oh yes. Yeah. So like hitting, screaming, pushing, probably like you said, because he can't because your child can't communicate so they're engaging in some challenging behavior crying okay great you guys have a good list screaming hitting kicking easier transitions yeah so you want to increase that transition behavior and decrease um, the challenging behavior that's coming with it whining yelling great thank you guys so let's talk about reinforcement i'm sure you're going to hear in your aba journey you'll hear reinforcement constantly we talk about it all the time so let's talk about it. So we wanna understand why a behavior is occurring. So regardless of what the behavior looks like, your child is trying to communicate what they want or need. 
So when we shift our understanding of their behavior to a form of communication, kind of like what Felicia was saying earlier, we can begin to try to understand it as a type of language. It's important to remember that our children may not know how to communicate some of their wants and needs with us, or perhaps they do know how and they just don't wanna use that in the moment. Either way, we're here to help them understand how to get the things they want in a more appropriate way. Chances are they're doing what they think is the easiest way to get something. And that's where reinforcement comes in. Reinforcement is what happens, whatever happens after a behavior that increases the likelihood of that behavior occurring in the future. So let's dive into it. So an example would be, Timmy wants a bead to finish his craft project. He says bead, his mom gives it to him. In the future, he says, when he wants one, he asks for it. So the behavior we're looking at is requesting and the reinforcer in this case was bead. We know it was reinforcing because when he wanted another bead in the future, he just asked for it. Uh, another example would be Cameron wants to swing at the park. She cries when told to wait and her mom puts her on a swing. In the future, she whines and cries when she wants the swing and does not immediately get it. So the behavior here is crying and her behavior was reinforced by access to the swing. So now she's learned, okay, if I want some, if I want the swing, I have to whine and cry. Now let's practice. Um, let's look at the function or the reason for the behavior. So in ABA, we believe there's four main functions for why behavior occurs. So the first one is access. Behavior is attempting to get an item, activity, or environment. So if we think of like challenging behavior, maybe, um, Timmy will wants a cookie so that he hits mom and he's like, I want access to that cookie and then he gets it. So instead of allowing him to have a cookie after he engages in hitting, we can have a teachable moment by prompting, can I have it? Cookie, more time, give it back, pointing, reaching, anything that is more socially appropriate than engaging in challenging or aggressive behavior. There's also attention. So behavior is occurring to get attention from someone. So I'm sure you guys are all parents. So you've seen this, your child sees that maybe you're distracted by something else and wants your attention and maybe throws something across the room or screams or does something to gain your attention. So instead of reinforcing that, we could have a teachable moment like tapping them on the shoulder, teaching a tap on the shoulder, saying, look at me, saying maybe like, listen to my story, having some sort of socially appropriate response. Escape is another function. So this behavior is occurring to get away from something aversive. Again, I'm sure you've seen this and have engaged in escape behavior yourself. Someone asks you maybe to clean your room and you run away or you say no, or you do something else. You're trying to escape something aversive. So instead of that, a teachable moment would be teaching maybe not now, or can I have another minute? Maybe shaking their head no. Maybe learning a first then statement. So maybe it's like, hey, can I finish playing with my cars and then can I clean my room? And then there's self-stim, self-stimulation. So that's behavior that's occurring because it's automatically reinforcing. So this would be an example of, there is no outside uh, force that is contributing to this behavior, it's all internal. So some stims that I do is I play with my hair a lot, I'll shake my foot and fidget. Some that we see with our learners could be hand flapping, sometimes vocal stereotypy where they're making noise and just like regulating their volume. Um, sometimes I see kids like staring at lights or like lining stuff up and looking at it. So let's think about the behaviors that you defined you would like to decrease. What do you think is something that's reinforcing your child's behavior currently that's causing it to maintain? So think about like the crying or aggression. Do you think that that's being maintained by escape, access, attention, or self-stim? You guys can put that in the comments. Self-stim, I see. Flopping, escape. Escape, yeah, lots of escape usually. Escape, depends on the situation, but all of the above, yeah. And I think that is something that you think of. So maybe the behavior looks the same, but the context in which these, uh, in which the behavior occurs. So maybe crying looks the same for everything, but maybe you just said, uh, your child asked for a cookie and you said no and they start crying. So then they want access to that. Or maybe uh, again, you're on the phone and they want your attention, so they start crying. That again, is the same topography, but different function. And then escape, maybe you ask them to clean the room and they start crying. Access of screaming is the only way he can tell us he wants something. Yeah, 
And that's a big barrier as well. So if our children don't have any way to communicate, then they will engage in challenging behavior because that's the only way that they can get their message across. So if we start thinking of everything as all these behaviors have a function, there's a reason behind it, then we can start figuring out ways to teach appropriate um, communication or teach appropriate behavior so they can get that same function in a way that is way more socially appropriate and that allows them to get these things a lot easier than having to engage in something um, potentially dangerous. So let's talk about positive reinforcement. So positive reinforcement is getting something that they want. It's the addition of something following a behavior to increase that likelihood of that behavior. So an example would be Lily raises her hand and the teacher calls on her to answer a question. She gets positive reinforcement. So she raised her hand, a teacher called on her, she answered, she got positive reinforcement in the form of the teacher's attention and being able to answer the question. Example two, Carson's brother has his favorite toy. Carson grabs the toy from his brother and runs into the other room. <laughs> so this one, he wanted the toy, he took the toy, and then now he's reinforced because he has access to the toy, which is what he wanted. And then example three, Timmy's in his bedroom playing with his toy cars. Mom comes in and says, all right, Timmy, time to clean your toys up. As a result, Timmy begins to whine. Timmy ends up with an extra few minutes to play with his cars. This is an um, example of escape. He escaped it, but he was positively reinforced because um, he got extra time. Let's talk about negative reinforcement. So a negative reinforcement, it basically means you're getting some, out of something unpleasant or aversive. So in example one, Kamal's mom gives him peas for dinner. Kamal begins throwing the peas on the floor. His mom takes the peas away and he gets something else. So this was negative, he was contacted negative reinforcement. He was, he threw the peas and then those peas got taken away. So he's like, cool, next time, if I don't want something, I'll throw it. Um, negative reinforcement took place. Example two, Veronica's baby sister begins to scream. Veronica covers her ears. Veronica's mom tells her sister, takes her sister to the other room. So in this case, the, the thing that happened right before screaming, that noise was pretty aversive to Veronica. So she covers her ears. She's being negatively reinforced. She's removing, she's doing a behavior of covering her ears. And then her mom takes her sister away, removing that aversive stimuli. So now she knows that if a loud noise happens, I can cover my ears and my mom will probably remove it. The key here is that something is taken away after the behavior. So positive, you wanna think of just like math, something is added after a behavior and negative, something is removed after the behavior. So it's not really like pop culture always says where negative is like bad and positive is good. Positive is just the addition, negative is just the removal or subtraction. So let's talk about creating a teachable moment, kind of something we already talked about earlier. So for access, again, behavior is attempting to get an item or activity or environment. So a teachable moment is prompting, can I have it? Can I have more time? Can I give it back? Pointing, asking for the, name, the thing by name. Attention is behavior is occurring to get attention from someone. So again, instead of screaming or crying or hurting someone, it's tapping them on the shoulder saying, hey mom, hey dad, look at me over here, doing a wave, something like that. Escape, behavior is occurring to get away from something aversive. So teaching like a one more minute, teaching them to say one more minute, teaching them to ask one more minute, saying like, hey, not now, maybe teaching them to shake their head, like, hey, I'm not done with my, whatever I'm doing, um, or using like a first then statement. So like, first I wanna finish this, then I'll do X, Y, Z. And then self-stim, self so behavior is occurring because it's automatically reinforcing. So something like mouthing um, can be really challenging if there's like a lot of things in the environment that your child can mouth. So giving them like a mouth or a teether that they can engage in that behavior, get that sensory stimulation, but it's a lot safer. Um, or doing like imitation with toys. So showing them how to engage with different toys to ideally get that same feedback in a more socially appropriate and potentially safer way. Um, Okay, yeah, we can just jump into questions because we only have a couple of minutes and I will, like I said, we'll send this to you. We also do these ABA, uh, welcome to, or intro to ABA courses every, um, set every month. Okay, so one of the questions, is, what are your ABA recommendations for kids who are refusing or resisting attending or participating in virtual school? Please discuss different strategies for different age groups, including younger pre-K age skills, kids. So, Something that I'm always thinking of um, when I have kids who are on Zoom, which is pretty common these days, is to think about 
Um, what is their schedule of reinforcement? So what are they getting access to for attending school? Um, some and also what are the component skills that they might need? So think about what I'm, so I'm sitting here talking to you and I have to know how to sit in a chair or sit on my bed. Um, I know I have to know to orient to a screen. I have to be re contacting some sort of reinforcement. I am through you guys asking questions and participating, but for your child, they may need something a little bit more tangible. So you can definitely work with your child and figure out something that they can, like uh, something that they can gain access to for sitting in a chair, for looking at the instructor. And I would start with very like small steps. So maybe you're not gonna be able to go to school, like attend to class the whole time, but it's maybe it's like, let's sit down and look at the teacher for one minute, great. Here's access to your train set or something that you really enjoy for, for like a minute. And then let's go back and do it again. You have to think of it as like very small steps and think of all of the skills, especially for little, little guys, like pre-K age kids. They're not used to sitting in front of a screen unless it's like a TV, but and, in, and engaging with a, a teacher. So you wanna find things that are really fun for them to have them practice sitting um, outside of school, maybe doing something really preferred. So you can start pairing, um, the Zoom sessions or computer sessions with something that's fun and then working for a tangible item that they can have um, and work for when they are doing the correct behavior. So when they are sitting, when they are participating, when they are following directions from a teacher. Um, what kind of homework or training do parents get for helping our son when he's home? We wanna help him, but don't really know what we should do. Um, yeah, so in Beerman, your BCBA will be working with you. We make treatment plan goals for every kid and every parent. So we will work with that you and say like, hey, these are the things that we're working on in the center. We want you to work with that at home. So it could be, it depends on your child. I've done stuff like um, safety commands, if that's something that's really um, something we want to generalize across our children. So maybe we'll work on it in the center first. So like stop, come here, wait, stuff like that. And then once we get like a good Handle on that, we'll have you guys start working on that. We'll also work a lot on communication. So whatever communication method that your child is engaged in, we will definitely want you to participate and help. So we want you to have them engage with their pecs or engage with their AAC or engage in vocal verbal language throughout their day. It's not just like when they come home, they just stop working. It's kind of like, okay, like we're working on them pointing to a request. So I want you to, before they can have something, hold up things and have them point to them so that you can Really, they can really learn how to generalize and maintain those skills. Every um, child is different, so all homework assignments are different. But um, we definitely, um, I think it depends, but like communication, play skills, um, feeding, sometimes like bath time routines, if that's something that's challenging as well. Um, do you offer remote ABA therapy services? How does that work? So we do do... Um, if you're a client with us, we can do um, remote services. You're gonna have to talk to your BA about if we think that's an appropriate method for your learner. That's something that we really, um, like Felicia was saying too, some um, children work better when it's um, in person and some children are able to attend and follow remote instruction. Definitely at the beginning of COVID, that was something that we explored with some learners. And again, it just depends on the client. Sometimes it's really short sessions because your kids can't sit for very, like kids, or they can't sit for a super long time, or it's like lots of breaks um, in between. And then we're just working on programming that we think is appropriate for them, for um, working on those component skills that we need them to do and um, getting them as ready for, um, or increasing their independence as much as possible. So again, it depends on the learner. It depends on if we think that's an appropriate strategy for your child. Any suggestions for prompting a child out of his imagination? So I think for this, something that Felicia said too, that we always say is like talking a lot about what you're doing, where you're going, um, what you're doing throughout your day and trying to incorporate your child as much as possible into that. And then also trying to um, show them a like play pattern, show them other things, ex show them the world, I think is really great. So if they're engaged in play by themselves, maybe you can sit next to them and play with their things in a different way and show them how to play that way and how to, um, communicate with the outside world and communicate with uh, their family, with their friends, just to be um, more involved. And then when they do show you like interest or like even look at you, reinforce that through praise or through a tangible item or through something that you know that they really love. So they can start pairing like, oh, when I look over, or when I um, follow directions or when I attend to what's going on um, in my environment, all these wonderful things happen. 
If you have a child who is extremely self-directed and independent, how do you recommend redirecting them to a parent or teacher directed activity? So again, I want to think you want to think about reinforcement. So you definitely want to know things that your child is motivated to work for and motivated to um, follow directions for. So I definitely would look at that and see what they are motivated for and then use that to be like, hey, like we only get, maybe we only get the iPad when we sit down and follow directions for a couple of minutes. And that's something that you definitely will work with over time with your BA. It's not something that's just going to happen overnight. We definitely, every child is different and we want to make sure that they have the component skills needed to follow directions. So we're looking at your entire child and every, all of their skills and determining what they, we need to do to get them to follow directions and follow teacher's instructions without just like doing whatever they want at the time. Um, do I have any thoughts or opinions about Montessori approaches in ABA? I can only speak to um, ABA. I'm not like an expert on Montessori, so I can't speak to that. I can say that ABA is an evidence-based practice, that we everything is data-driven, everything is researched, um, which is why insurance covers us as an effective method for um, treating children diagnosed with autism, but I can't speak about Montessori um, just because I'm not um, an expert in that and I wouldn't want to give any um, incorrect information. How do I know if in-home ABA or center-based ABA would work for my child? I think it's just through experiencing these different types of centers, um, seeing what um, your child adapts to and knows. It depends on their age as well. Um, I would talk to, um, if, obviously, if you're in the process of intake process, that's something that your BA or the CD will review with you, um, what they think is appropriate for you. We are center-based, so that's something that we love doing. It's really great. It's a nice way to work on social skills. It's a nice way to um, get your child ready for school and get them ready to like go into a different place. Um, but it just depends. Every kid is different. So I definitely would touch base with your BA or your clinical develop, um, clinical director to see what they suggest. Do you have any other questions? All right. Well, thank you so much. Oh, wait, I think, nope, we're good. Thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Uh, like I said, we will send out this full presentation so you'll see the rest of it. I apologize for um, us running out of time. It just sometimes happens. Um, yeah, thank you all. And if you guys have any other questions and just wanna to speak to me privately, I'll be on for a couple more minutes, but otherwise you're free to leave, but thank you again. Thank you. All right, thank you all. Have a, oh, whoops. Um, for this, I just think um, as kids come with us and like are in, are with us, they definitely change in their levels of independence and in communication, in um, social skills and play skills. So I definitely think over time, you will have to just constantly be evaluating your child and evaluating their skill set. And that's something that we're constantly doing through um, collecting data and making sure that they are making like socially significant um, changes to their behavior. Hopefully that answered your question. All right, thank you all for coming and have a great night.